I, I thought I'd run through a little background on what EcoHealth Alliance is and what we do. Um, and then I think that, and I'll just use that kind of as a theme for this One Health. And um, I've been calling it One Health in the 21st century, though we've been in this century for almost two decades now. But it doesn't seem that it's just starting to feel that way to me. Um, and I wanted to kind of move us along in our thinking about integration between disciplines and kind of where this One Health started um, and say more about some of the possibilities we can do and thinking a little creatively. Uh, so, I don't know if you're familiar with EcoHealth Alliance, but we're a 501c3, a nonprofit based in New York. Um, the focus of the work is on the linkages between ecology and health, hence the name. The organization is actually about 45 years old. It was called the, it was started by Gerald Durrell, who was a British naturalist that now liked to travel the world and help wildlife. And he formed a group in Philadelphia called the Wildlife Trust to raise money for his program in the UK, and actually on Jersey Island. Um, over the years it grew and they started doing more and more um, health-related ecology work, so about 10 years ago it changed the name to EcoHealth Alliance, so it's quite old. Um, the Alliance part is that all our projects are implemented by local partners. So wherever we work around the world or in the U.S., um, we have implementing partners, and that number is somewhere above 60 of these kind of partners. Some are government partners, some are NGOs, some are universities. Um, so we are very small. We have a, I think our total staff is 50 people. Um, but we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people working on projects around the world and they work in their country and we have a big focus on uh, local engagement. They help design the projects and implement the projects. Um, I think that's good enough for that. Uh, the big, uh, where the spin-off really came, you know, 10 years ago, uh, was in some of the modeling work that members of the team did and you might um, remember this from 2008, which was basically um, the hotspots of disease emergence. So a big focus of the organization's effort is still on emerging infectious diseases, and the team in New York is really, um, a large majority of that team is the modeling team, and doing this type of work in technology and software development there. And then, so I'll kind of give you a mix of kind of what we do with, uh, on the modeling side, but then some examples of what the field projects end up looking like and how we somehow pull those together. Um, so we all know, hopefully everybody's familiar with this trend in emerging infectious diseases. Over the last few decades, we're all familiar with the fact that most of those are zoonotic and most of those are linked to wildlife. Um, if we take kind of a historical perspective and looking at where emerging infectious disease events have occurred, uh, we get a very biased uh, view of that based on um, uh, kind of the inherent you know, nature of science and medicine and the fact that where are diagnostics better, where are people more likely to publish, um, where are people more prone to reporting anything they find. Um, and so it looks like if you just look at all emerging infectious diseases lumped together, uh, they're very focused in the developed world in Europe and North America, some in Australia. Um, but what the original work that was done with hotspots, and now we're kind of on a new version, kind of looks like this, is looking at the underlying factors, risk factors, or the characteristics um, un uh, underpinning where those events took place, correcting for the reporting bias, and then remapping where the risk factors are, rather than mapping where the events are. So. Um, there's several versions of hotspots map. You know, Tony Fauci always uses the one that's very dramatic. Basically, the whole planet is covered with emerging infectious disease events um, because he picked ones um, that stood out that we all remember. And the point was to say it's a global problem. When you actually look at the risk factors for emerging infectious diseases, you get a kind of a different distribution, and the world is not all equal. Um, so you see some places certainly have more of those risk factors than others. A lot of people have been calling these the drivers of emerging EID, so commonly say what are the underlying drivers. Um, I've kind of just recently start, learned, you know, from many of your, your community in basic risk analysis and 
epidemiology to stop saying they're drivers because this is not causality. We don't know what the causes of these events are. We just know they correlate with certain conditions. So I'm pushing, I'm going back to the traditional term of risk factors there. But what we see really drives that. Sure. Um, you wouldn't cause any, call any of these uh, a causal relationship? I can't tell you why. I think that I think many of them are proxies for something else that's going on. So we human population and human population growth are clearly linked, but I don't know that by having another kid that causes Zika. Right, but like change so and it's I don't know what the mechanism is. I think it's a good thank you for bringing it up. So, you know, the more detail you pay attention to, say, what, well, what's the mechanism in land use change? Is it a change in the density of animals? Is it a change in the density of people? Is it contact rates? Is it vector abundant? I don't know. Really, what's truly causing the problem? I just know it's highly correlated. So is the, is the map showing locations of the first detection recognition of a new disease? That is. This map is population that we, when we do, um, so we take about, it's over 250 globally gridded databases on demographics, GDP, number of healthcare workers, number of hospitals, uh, road systems. So you can get globally gridded data sets for all of those and then match them with these and pull out the ones that actually correlate to those locations. And that's these factors there on the left, basically land use change, pasture change, urbanization, those things seem to correlate with where those red dots were, and then you map the factors instead of mapping the events. Does that make sense? Now, of course, at countries, every country is a little different, and this is where the resolution starts to get weak, because you might only have four or five events in the last 60 years, emerging disease events, in one country. So now we're starting to lose our resolution, of course, statistically speaking. Um, so it's not as perfect, but you do see um, there are different correlations, different drivers, different risk factors in different countries, um, and which, of course, makes sense. The, the world is not homogenous. Um, but we also see, and I always use this slide to say I, I'm encouraged, at least for public health and for um, preventing which is which we really try and focus on prevention, um, is that these drivers or risk factors um, line up with different types of transmission <coughs> pathways. So with land use change, we're seeing a lot more with vector-borne diseases, hence why I threw out maybe it's a change in vectors distribution. So now we're starting to kind of get a little closer to what it is. Or in agricultural industry change, so these are really big factors for disease emergence. Um, you get more uh, things with agricultural industry about contact with livestock, animal, you know, contact with animals, oral transmission, so you get more fecal oral emerging infectious diseases than you do with land use change, which are really related about disturb or habitat disturbance, which probably has something to do with vectors, vector abundance, because 60% of those are vector-borne diseases that we see there. The encouraging thing I find out, because a lot of people say, well, every time you find a new infectious disease or a new emerging disease, we have to spend years figuring out what to do about it, and then we have to develop a new vaccine that only takes 15 years, and so it's like one bug, one drug, one bug, one drug, and now we have 256 emerging disease events, so it's going to take us several hundred years to cope with all of them. Except in the world of public health and prevention, there's there's actually things you can do to prevent transmission that have commonality. So all of those vector-borne diseases kind of lump in this category of improving vector control and reducing human exposure. We don't actually have to come up with a brand new treatment in many cases if we just use old treatments more effectively. Not that we do vector control very well, um, obviously, 
the malaria and Zika, um, but we actually do know what to do, we just don't do it very well. So it's not the lack of science, it's the lack of implementation. Um, so we can look at these different ways. We did this um, for, based on the IOM's drivers of disease emergence, which actually came from at that time from this Institute of Medicine report. And we looked at all those emerging disease events and put them, scored them in these categories. And once again, we get the same. So using different methods, came up with really the same type of results about land use change, agricultural industry change, are really the big risk factors or drivers, as it was called it at that time of the thing. Um, the thing for me that's fascinating, because I spent a lot of my time working with wildlife and bushmeat trade and early days in the uh, late 90s with Ebola outbreaks, which were you know, clearly all linked back at that time with uh, eating chimps and gorillas and you know, some contact with that, so we didn't understand that thing. So I always thought bushmeat was a big driver of emerging infectious diseases, so you have HIV AIDS, you know, have Ebola, so the big headline ones, SARS with the markets and the wildlife markets, but really it's a very tiny percentage uh, of the real number. Uh, so it's always sobering when you look at real data um, to find out that things you really trusted and believed in are not necessarily true. Um, so it's been eye-opening for me to have actual objective an objective look at, the, at this. Um, and you can do it for different kinds of diseases. There's foodborne EID events. Most of it actually related to bacteria instead of viruses. Our organization really focuses on viral diseases, so I think we're missing the boat in the foodborne world, um, but it's an area to explore. And so my favorite foodborne disease, of course, is Ebola, um, which we don't typically think of that, but I do. Um, so, you know, that link, like I said, I've spent a lot of time with the bush meat, and we kind of think of this as Ebola outbreaks. This is the, what we imagine. Um, but really, that root where they begin comes from this world, um, which is the consumption of wild meat and the contact with wildlife in some way or another. And it's a huge, um, it's a huge consumption pattern there. This is about a billion kilograms a year of bush meat are consumed just in Central Africa alone, not West Africa. Not East, not other parts, not Asia, just Central Africa. So you see, um, when you think about contact, the opportunity for contact is pretty high. So even though these, some of these emerging disease events are really rare, um, you can start to understand that while the prevalence or the, the presence of some of these infectious organisms are very uncommon, extremely rare, even in wildlife, it's kind of overwhelmed by the volume, uh, the nature of the volume. And um, as I mentioned yesterday, about avian influenza and chickens, and some people are surprised it's linked to with the influenza and poultry, um, and the fact that we somehow say that some influenza is a natural occurring disease, but we have raised 10 billion chickens in the U.S., and we raised 10 billion chickens in China, and there's nothing natural about that that's only been present in the history of our species that's only been going on for about 50 years. So there's nothing really natural about that production system either. Um, and we force through these rare events into large, you know, multiplied by a billion, multiplied by 10 billion. We only see a very small percentage, less than 10% of these events are even linked to bushmeat. So it's just a really kind of a fascinating thing that we see it at all. But it, I think it's about volume. So, of course, what people here in the U.S. worry about is that you don't have to. You might not live in a hot spot, um, but you probably live near an airport that's eight or ten hours away from a hot spot. Um, so you can do some nice modeling, uh, which is just about you know, calculating those risk factors uh, with uh, air, airline travel. And you get something like this, which is EID risk per airport, which I'm seeing becomes applied. So I mentioned earlier we're doing some work with Homeland Security and it's really about looking at airports and customs and where more vigilance is required versus less vigilance. And you see, especially if you live in Canada, you're pretty safe at the airport. It's a great place to fly into if you want to go through Canada <laughs> on your way. <laughs> it's, always, it's always better. Uh, unfortunately, Dulles and, <laughs> Dulles and those red, I think is one of those red ones. Um, I don't know. I don't. 
I don't think so. I don't think it ever got in. No. Parviz, who did all this work, is now a fellow of the State Department, so I'm sure he'll never publish again. <laughs> there's there's no doctor to do that. Yeah. Um, but we have turned some of it into some um, software and technology. So this was published, we call it FLIRT, which is the flight information risk of something or another. It's just some cute acronym. And we ran it for Zika and got that published. And then we, this is uh, online available free for anybody to use. So we took Parviz's models and just put it online as a tool. And um, we're also playing with this for some other contract work we're doing for Homeland Security because they'd like higher resolution. But you can go on to this software and you can see if there's an outbreak somewhere in the world, um, you can see where those flights, where the passengers are going. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. And of course, it doesn't have to be, the, system, the software doesn't care about it. It's being an infectious disease, you can just see use it for anything related to passenger travel. Um, and we just see that as a good proxy for the possible routes of introduction since things do move with humans. Um, even some of the livestock diseases, so if you look at <coughs> a lot of worry about African swine fever, big outbreaks in Europe, it was introduced in the Caucasus originally from Africa, the Russians spread it through their military system up and down the eastern, uh, western part of Russia finally broke into uh, the European Union, um, and they, people thought it was kind of contained in Poland, the Czech, you know, Czech Republic, and Ukraine, but of course now, two weeks ago, it popped up in Belgium, um, which was clearly spread by people, either in a car or an airplane, they did not walk 3,000 kilometers across Europe and up in Belgium. So air, tra air transport is probably a really good indicator, and Certainly for the risk to the U.S., that would be the case. Um, and then you can use that same approach of looking at the risk factors and mapping risk factors instead of mapping events. And we moved on it for the original work was uh, zoonotic diseases. You can do it for AMR. It's a nice little map for drug-resistant uh, pathogens, uh, vector-borne pathogens, whatever you want. So, you, you know, once you kind of capture this approach, I'll show you some examples of what else we did. Um, and you can look forward with those same kind of factors if you want to. This is um, the B1 um, scenario for climate change. So you look at kind of what the world would be at, like in 2050 under that scenario, which is a fairly conservative scenario, and then map across something like where would the distribution of possible reservoir host be for a certain disease. And so this is Nipah virus, uh, which is right now, kind of India, Bangladesh, um, into Malaysia. But you can see actually green means reduced risk and red means increased risk. So you get a different distribution because these diseases, infectious diseases, are linked to ecosystems and ecosystems will change with climate change. So you have to rethink the distribution, the geographic distribution of this. Um, for the reduced risk, what is causing the reduced risk? Is it the conditions of the ecosystem? Is it the conditions of the social environment? Um, how is it predicting that? This is a reduced risk. I'm interested. That's in. a great question. This is based kind of on um, ecological factors there, and a lot of that is um, is a deep virus. It's a, a reservoir, a mammalian reservoir host. So it's really about the distribution of possible host for that. Because without the reservoir, you know, it's not maintained in humans. Um, it's maintained in an animal reservoir. So once you lose that reservoir, you lose the disease drops out because humans can't maintain it um, that way. There's some interesting things because people say, well, why would it come to the Western Hemisphere? Um, because you would need a host. But we've also learned over the last 50 years, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's close to a thousand. Does somebody know the number of um, invasive alien species in the US from that work? The invasive species, hundreds, if not thousands, of 
hundreds of them, it's comfortably say, of alien invasive species in the United States over the last 100, 200 years. Um, so that's another thing that's happening all the time in globalization of this invasive species. So when you say, oh, you could never have Nipah virus in the Western Hemisphere because we don't have the right reservoir, there's actually, you can show that actually the habitat will be very good for the right reservoirs with climate change. And then all you have to do, currently, if you release one of those animals intentionally or accidentally, it would die, but in 2050 it won't die. It will probably become established. So a lot of the reason invasive aliens that are not here is because we currently don't have a good habitat for them. But that's all changing too, because they're always being released and introduced. If you look at Florida as a great example. Um, and I just wanted to point out that it's not just about infectious diseases. I'm going to like, talk about EIDs and infectious diseases this whole morning, but it's not really. All of these kind of ecological factors are related. I mentioned um, AMR, which is kind of infectious diseases. But anyway, this is kind of, um, this is work, you know, if any of you know Asafi Yamba, um, we did this work, and this is kind of an El Nino event, which is another kind of proxy severe weather. It kind of gives you an indication of what might happen with climate change. Uh, but some of these things are, you get fisheries collapses, so you have nutritional problems here. We see it more eating mammals and seabirds. You have massive die-offs of seabirds because the fisheries collapse from the change in water temperature. So it goes from cold water to warm water. Warm water in, the, in an El Nino, you lose your fish, the fishery stock kind of goes away. Seabirds start dying, sea lions start dying. In the south, I didn't mention, of course, um, right here, Louisiana is really prone to uh, copper and selenium deficiencies. They have nutritional disease with El Nino events because there's more rainfall in the southern U.S. Uh, during the El Nino years. So the grass grows faster and greener, and people that raise, this is a big production area for livestock. Actually, most livestock in the U.S. are born there, cattle. It's the biggest cattle production area in the U.S. And then they're shipped to the Midwest for feedlot, for raising. But they're born in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. In that rainfall, the calves all get copper selenium deficiencies because they're eating bright, lush green grass, and so they drop dead unless the ranchers actually, um, supplement them with additional copper and selenium. So it changes the economics of raising livestock um, and the cost of beef just based on the rainfall patterns in the Pacific Ocean. And it has global effects, so we see it all around the world. One event affects the whole health nature of the planet. Um, and then I want to get into this uh, one health thing that we kind of always are talking about these days. And just to say that, that um, this relationship about uh, humans and the environment and animals changes depending on which disease we're talking about or which factor it's not even, like I said, doesn't have to be an infectious disease. Um, but this relationship of who are the players, so we're really talking about Inter interdisciplinary collaboration or intersectoral collaboration. Um, and I, I just wanted to just kind of say that it's not always equal. Um, Sometimes it really, you know, it's really driven by a, an issue in one sector and the other sectors or other collaborators have a little to contribute. It's not always an equal partnership in everything, but we feel like um, there's always contributions you can have by including other groups of people who think differently and have different approaches. So I just want to kind of use this to illustrate the fact that it's a flexible approach. Um, I, we, we tend to focus, and my interests certainly are about infectious diseases, not just EIDs, and really the thinking behind that is uh, this, once again, conservative number of about a, a billion human cases a year of, um, of diseases that we Demic or emerging, it doesn't really matter, but they are zoonotic and they're you know, linked to animals. So it's a, a really big burden of disease on humans of, of the planet. Some people say up to 2 billion, <clears throat> and I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just not quite comfortable uh, saying that number. But let's say conservatively a billion, and two thirds of those are zoonotic. Actually, a third are not. So we have this kind of concept, well, what, what can we do about that? So you have the standard you know, epi curve of, of a disease outbreak, and we're kind of thinking like, what can we do on the left side of that curve? 
understanding that 66% of those infectious diseases or EIDs are linked to animals? Um, can we do a better job on the animal side and sustain an effort in one health to engage the animal health community and the environment community, really? Uh, so we can look at, on the left side, do a better job of forecasting prediction prevention and reduce the impact on the humans, which is that red part, and that little light blue section is really the benefits, the cost savings, effectiveness, increased effectiveness, um, you know, reduced alleys, something we can measure to show that working earlier prevention, earlier control actually has these demonstrated benefits um, and hopefully try and measure some of that, which is not being done very often. And so I'll give you two examples. Can, how, when would you like me to stop? I'm just going to kick you down around nine. Okay. Stop whenever you'd like. Okay. Or just stop. Okay. So let me give you just two stories. Uh, there is time for that. So everybody familiar with leptospirosis, one of the most common bacterial diseases. It uh, affects humans and wildlife and livestock. It's basically, it's not ubiquitous, but it's common around the world. It's treatable. In animals, there's actually a vaccine too, easily, very easy to treat. But usually confused in much of the world with dengue fever, other infectious diseases, typically are often confused, they're just lepto cases. 25% of dengue fever diagnosis in Southeast Asia are actually just lepto. You give them tetra to create the Persian person. Um, doxycycline, really cheap for pennies, they would be treated. Normally, though, they're just sent home and said, you have dengue, there's nothing we can do, um, which is very sad. Um, at risk, um, healthcare workers, certainly, people work with animals, and of course, animals. So it's, it's this is kind of the way I was taught in school about how to determine where the risk is for um, infectious disease. You look at the historical presence or of a disease, you look at laboratory data, so this comes from uh, one laboratory, IDEX laboratory, and these are spatial clusters of a uh, high rate of positive test results for lepto. This is for dogs. We don't actually have this for humans um, because it was reportable disease for a very long time and then it became non-reportable. Um, and then CDC has just made it reportable again about three years ago, so we don't have really good human data, but dogs get it the same way humans get it. It's very similar, um, so I'm just going to use this as a proxy, uh, the best we can do. But you, you'll see there's some differences there. So anyway, that would be a map of where it's dangerous um, to get le where the highest risk of leptospirosis is based on historical reports of lepto that are confirmed by laboratory diagnosis. Um, we were all taught that it has to do with rainfall, that leptos has to do with flooding and rainfall. We did this analysis, as Mike brought up, we looked at 250 data sets that are gridded down to one kilometer square for the U.S. with so soil type, education level, tree type. And you can get great data sets now in the U.S. Geological Survey and from the Census Bureau and just run them because with those lab results. Um, rainfall, it doesn't really line up with rainfall at all because rainfall and flooding are really different. So we get flooding in Arizona with very little rainfall. It has to do with soil type, topography, land use. Is it paved and asphalt, or is it trees and forests? Is it rocky? So you know there are a lot of ecological factors that go along with flooding besides rainfall patterns. So there's a lot of things I was taught in school, it's like, oh, we're going to get a lot of rain here, and I love those. It's not really true, because when we do that on a map, it doesn't really help. Um, interestingly, income and education fit with positive test results. So that's weird for infectious disease, except, remember, we're basing this on laboratory diagnostics, which means there has to be a laboratory there has to be a client, there has to be somebody to pay for it, and who's willing and generally educated enough to take their 
in this case their dog, to a veterinarian, the veterinarian suspects lepto, sends it to a diagnostic lab, requests that test, and someone has to be willing to pay, the client has to say, yeah, sure, I'm willing to pay $35 to have it tested versus $5 just to treat the dog. Let's spend extra money and test it too. So it's an interesting thing in medical practice in general. Um, and so you get a bias, of course, towards that in the results. So that's not really helping us too much. So as I said, we did these partial dependence blocks. The modeling team jumps on this and goes like, okay, what are all those, out of those 250 possible factors that we have data for to compare? Um, you know, which ones start to shake out? And you get like positive and negative correlations on them. Hopefully some of you do enough statistics uh, that you can see that, but I can give you some of the kind of roll up that we get these boosted regression trees, and you see that the underlying factors, once again, for where they have positive tests, and this is down to county level, we did every county in the United States, there's several thousand, two to three thousand counties, um, that it's got linked to evergreen cover, shrub cover, herbaceous thing. On the left are PCRs, just means that the animals are shedding the bacteria, the spirochete. On the right where there's antibodies, it means they weren't shedding at the time, but they have antibodies against it. It means they were probably exposed in the last year or so, because antibodies are not lifetime. Um, so you see some of these factors, median income through in there, it's not very strong, but it's still there. Um, so once again, does forest cause leptospirosis? No. But there's something about forest cover, probably, is a great habitat for the reservoir. Reservoirs are rodents, raccoons, some of the common wildlife reservoirs that shed this bacteria. So that you get a proxy for that because we don't have a gridded data set for uh, rodents in every county of the United States. I can't tell you how many species and how many rats are blocked by county anywhere. But we do have data sets from satellite imagery for the habitat type. So these are pro end up being proxies. Once again, something we don't fully understand, but they're very strong correlations. And then we get a risk map like this for leptospirosis, which is very different if you remember the hotspots map. Oh, sorry. This is just zooming in for our place. I think I have hotspots. Here. So that was one of the original ones. This is the historical records and where we would be taught where to do, where to vaccinate for lepto, where to worry about it, when to send in a lab, when to treat somebody, when to be suspicious if you're a practitioner or clinician. This is the risk map based on where the real risk factors are. So we not really have not been doing a good job of paying attention to where we should be preventing this disease either by vaccinating or catching it early and treating it because this is really risk. This is just history. Um, and I certainly, and even yesterday we were hearing people talk about, we still, people still talk about using historical data or confirmed lab results or something as a true indicator of where the risk of disease is. And we see it's really different. And on the upper right is we did some, we got the state vaccinations of dogs. We even broke that down by counties. Once again, there's no map in the United States gridded to county levels of dog populations. It's interesting, we don't know that. But we do know dogs are associated with humans. And so we can calculate that, you know, there's 0.7 dogs per family. And then you can map out where the families are and then you can kind of map out where dogs are. So you can kind of get a proxy for dog populations. Um, and you see that where people are vaccinating dogs done the line, actually historically very good, or with the risk factors. So you have vaccinations of dogs where the drug companies are doing the best job of selling vaccines, because they'd like to sell it anywhere they can. So this is an uptake map. This is a sales, it ended up being a good sales map, not a risk map. And then they really need to be pushing vaccinating dogs if they want to actually protect dogs in the areas where there's higher risk. Yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I just I was wondering now if the vaccination map will change that the combo lepto distemper vaccine is becoming more common. You know, it used to be you'd go to the vet and they'd have this 
separate lepto vaccine in the fridge, and they can say, well, you can have it if you want it, you know, if you take your dog to the dog park a lot. But now more and more you're seeing that lepto um, just already included in the distemper vaccine. And I was wondering if that was potentially an offshoot of this work that you did for Zoetis. It's possible. Is that a Zoetis I'm not sure. I have to look that up. I'm curious okay. now. Yeah. I do know that the the Zoetis, the pharmaceutical company, asked us to do this modeling, and they took it and developed a, an app for an iPad that they distribute to all their customers, to all their clients, the uh, veterinarians, so they can actually show to their client that they live in a risk by their county and say, you know, our county is a higher risk compared to these other counties, so they're using it as a marketing tool for the vaccine. Um, so that might also change sales. But this is all published. It's, in, it's peer reviewed and published. Right? Anybody can use that. Um, so the second one this is good. Uh, kind of a One Health approach. This is a vector borne disease, Rift Valley fever. If you're not familiar with that, it's kind of a complicated vector borne disease because it requires two different mosquitoes. Um, uh, by its one by itself doesn't really kick off a big epidemic or an outbreak. Um, and they are linked to differential rainfall. So um, one species, the uh, 80s mosquitoes in this case are flood water, so they only hatch out when there's flooding. So you, have to, you can't just have a little rain, you have to have a lot of rain cumulative over time for the water to rise up to reach the level of where they lay their eggs, because they lay their eggs up on the high banks, not near the water or in the water. Uh, so you have to have flooding first, so you have to have significant rainfall. Um, and then you get the outbreak of Culex mosquitoes, different species in the millions or billions. So then you get large, and they, Culex spread it from animal to animal to animal. So the 80s, when they hatch out, they keep the virus in them, theoretically. Those eggs could last 10 or 20 years with the virus inside. They hatch out, might just infect one or two animals, and then the Culex mosquitoes spread it across to hundreds of animals. So you get a massive outbreak, causes abortions and stillbirths. So in a matter of a few, four or five days, every sheep on the farm, and every cow would abort or have a stillbirth. So you lose your calf crop. So for farmers, it's pretty devastating. And then humans get it from handling animals, so that when the workers are touching animals, or there's an abortion or stillbirth, they touch it, or if they're butchering animals at a slaughterhouse, so those are at risk. So we designed a big project um, to look at the ecology and those links to see if we could better predict them, because just climate rainfall predictions don't work that well in Southern Africa. They work some places, but not in Southern Africa. Uh, so that's the study site. It's about the size of Ohio. It's a really big study site. And we enrolled about 250 farms. Each farm is about 20,000 acres um, with all of their animals. So we've got all of them enrolled in a longitudinal study. So those are the sites. Um, we did a really kind of a one health approach. So we looked at livestock and humans and wildlife and vegetation ecology. I'll show you a few pictures of that. We have remote sensing satellite imagery um, and also weather stations set up on the farms. And the farmers really like having a weather station. It's kind of a little perk for them for participating in that. And we link it so we do ground truth in the satellite data with really on the ground data. Uh, and that's rainfall. We even have moisture probes. We're doing soil science in there, integrated in soil science, and also uh, electronic probes that link to the weather station. Uh, so we can get soil moisture content. Um, we have grassland ecologists out there, botanists, doing surveys on vegetation. Because a mosquito has to lay its egg someplace, it doesn't just suspend it in air. It actually attaches it to base of roots around the wetlands. So you get wetland plants are involved. So you see the exact same site, dry season, rainy season. You see dramatic change in the same kind of place. It's one of the botanists out there. So they did weekly transects for four years on the same sites across all these farms to gather really accurate vegetation growth data, which was also matched to NDVI satellite green data. So we have ground truthing on the vegetation index also. Um, we're doing mosquito larvae collection, mosquito trapping. So we have entomologists involved, 
and then we have medical anthropologists out there actually interviewing uh, the farmers and the workers and getting asking questions related to their behavior, their contact with animals, their history and other information so we can get some behavior pattern, behavioral risk factors identified and then of course uh, sampling humans um, for serology and testing and sampling animals, livestock and wildlife. And so we've been doing that for about four years and now uh, pulling that together is a really kind of a one health field approach with real local engagement. It's all done by South Africans. The South African Wool Growers Association sponsors the project. The Dairy Farmers Association sponsors the projects. The farmers are excited because no one seemed to ever care about them or their animals or the fact they got sick. Um, and so it's really nice on the ground project kind of designed, managed, run uh, by them. And our role is to kind of develop the, the, science, the study design, the scientific design, and find them, find the money, which was funded by our U.S. Defense Department. We have to give thanks to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency for seeing this. Um, early findings are right, we're seeing about 10 percent, 9 percent in farm workers and abattoir workers. Uh, we're seeing that even though the farmers say they're vaccinated, their livestock, um, a lot of those vaccines are crap, or they don't use them well, or they're out of date, or they're just no good. Um, so people have been critical of the vaccines, and farmers particularly say the vaccines are no good, so then they stop using them. But actually, we actually tested the vaccines, and when used appropriately, they work really well. Um, so it's not really the problem with the vaccines, the vaccination programs, it's the implementing the vaccine is the real gap there. So, so, yes. Yeah, I, I think of RIF as really being, at least RIF as we know it today, a, a man-made disease the result of the introduction of European livestock and large numbers of European livestock into Africa. And if you look back for outbreaks of, uh, you know, the, some of the British colonial publications, I think it's around 1910, there's the first description of an unexplained die off of lambs which is, you know, when this is just getting going. So, so the puzzle is, you know, the virus has been there. I mean, it's in, in that environment. So if you remove European livestock, what, what do you think the picture of drift would look like? Um, we see it in wildlife, but not much on the clinical side. So I think African wildlife probably evolved and adapted to that disease thousands of years ago. Um, there is some reports on springbok, which are an African antelope that in South Africa is raised in huge numbers on farms, and some of them have reported this, so that could be a management issue about crowding together thousands of springbok in a combined area, <laughs> making them, forcing them to be exposed to a mosquito that also would be unnatural. But I agree with you. I think the livestock issue Essentially, it's, it's an experiment in introducing a uh, uh, well, I'm the susceptible word. host. Yeah, no, um, to monitor, you know, you're putting it. Oh. In canaries in the home, and you're putting yeah. animals there that are susceptible, yeah. trying to find out if there's a virus. It's, you know, sort of like the way Zika was discovered. Put some animals in places, yeah. see what happens. In the case of RIF, what you get are huge die offs. That's true. I guess that's Sentinel basic, animals, Sentinels, yeah. I guess that's really what we're doing to the planet with people. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> people there and see what happens. <laughs> see what happens. Just put some in the forest, see what happens, what they get. Yes. <laughs> Unintentionally, we're doing that. This <laughs> is true. And with livestock, by putting them everywhere. Um, uh, some of us mentioned why, why the truck. Why did truck? Oh. It's Rift Valley Fever is a specialist, classified as a special agent and it's weaponizable. Uh, so it's on the, the list of special agents. <coughs> Thank you for reminding me. It's not why we're working with it, but that is why they're working. Why they're funding it. That's why they're funding it. This is true. It's not a good disease. There's no cure. Um, and when it gets into people, it kills them. So it's a hemorrhagic fever. And not a pleasant thing. I do know some people who have survived, who have infected and survived, but it was not a fun 
time for that. And actually, you know, it depends when you think about diseases and um, forces. Is actually, if they're sick, it's more of a problem than if they die. So it takes several people to take care of a sick person. Um, so wounding soldiers, sick soldiers, are always a bigger hardship on the armed forces than just dead, dead soldiers. Let them lay there for a while and do something else. Um, okay, so I just want to finish up. I'll do this really quickly with some just think about some of you that are engaged in policy. So I mean, where does one health fit in? The sustainable development goals. We feel like health kind of goes across. Uh, it's not just limited to the health goal. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. With climate change, we're always wondering about one health and where does it fit in. So we did this little paper, but we're kind of trying to look at, you know, there's these fact contributing sectors to climate change that we're starting to understand. And then there's these kind of intermediate things, and then we're trying to look at health outcomes here down at the bottom, which, you know, where they could be. So we're trying to figure out, in our thinking, like, you know, where, what can we measure, what can we do if we're going to have some effects, um, what, is, what are the metrics going to be, and where should we kind of be focusing on um, some of these issues, and how to explain the, what climate change means as it flows through this system, you know, is it about a coal-fired power plant, or is it about malnutrition? It's not how those linkages tie together. I don't want to belabor it. Um, somebody here earlier mentioned on the economic side, we know that these emerging infectious diseases cost a lot of money. Most of that money is, has nothing to do with medical cost. So if you break that down, you can see kind of the the percentage of a cost, and let's say SARS with $30 billion, um, the percentage in the medical costs are really low. So we typically do that. Someone will come out with a number and say, well, it costs you know, a billion dollars to treat all these people. Um, but the real cost, the economic costs, were $30 billion because of the impact on global trade. So there are a lot of stakeholders <clears throat> that typically aren't at the table when we're having a conversation about global health global health security, a lot of the, the biggest stakeholders aren't even invited because we tend to think it's a health discussion and not a societal discussion. They're really trying to do more of this kind of work uh, to show <clears throat> that it's not just, it's, it's not a medical industry, not a medical conversation. It's a societal conversation when we're talking about one health. Fortunately, that word health is in there. So it really confuses people, but it's not a health discussion. It is a health discussion, it's not a medical discussion. <clears throat> We've been doing some work with the World Bank to try and help and for them, the bank to engage in this and how to implement um, these kind of One Health cross-disciplinary efforts into the bank's funding mechanisms, their loan programs or their grant programs. So this has been moving forward. <clears throat> and as part of this, they're going to start using some One Health assessments in countries to see how they qualify for loans and what kind of funding they can be getting. So we're really kind of using it as a carrot. And we've kind of done some mapping. I know some of you kind of do this too, but how does this all fit together? And we try to break, you know, break out these parts because I think of the kind of how these um, different efforts and programs are linked is confusing to a lot of people unless you're really fluent with them. So, you know, people throw around terms that international health regulations, and then somebody else, you know, talks about the Convention on Biodiversity, and then there's the Codex Alimentarius, which are the rules on moving food around, healthy food around the world, and they fall into kind of different groups. So you have kind of regulatory efforts, we have assessment tools, we have planning tools about action packages and planning tools, and I think wherever I go around the world, most people on the ground are really confused about how any of this works. To really try to come up with a map of that and help people, and these are all linked. This is in the World Bank document. And you can kind of zoom in to try and say that these different frameworks have to somehow work together um, and that we see that kind of one health theme helps to kind of push that agenda and get engaged some of the non medical groups. This is Convention on Biodiversity. We've been working with them to link them with the World Health Organization, look at biodiversity and human health and come out with some efforts for them. And they've actually passed a, 
uh, resolution of the CBD Convention on Biodiversity actually indicating uh, biodiversity linkages with health for member countries or convention. The U.S. is not a signatory <coughs> of the Convention on Biodiversity, and North Korea is not, but every other country is. Um, Besides North Korea, and it's nice that we've really paired up with North Korea in a, in a strong way that way. And we're working on those relationships even today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any familiar with Sendai Framework? This is about disaster risk reduction. We get excited about it because of this word, reduction. Not, it's not the Sendai Framework for disaster risk response. It's disaster risk reduction. And supposedly, countries that have signed on to this have committed to making efforts to reduce the risk of disasters. And we've been working with them to include health as actually a disaster. So I'll just skip to that. So we kind of took some of the same stuff they talked to you today, went to the Convention of Parties, or 3,000 people there, and said that health issues, diseases, are not just a result of disasters, they are disasters in many cases. And the risk reduction framework, what you're implementing, you need to also be putting in things that reduce the risk of health disasters, not just responding to earthquakes, but actually doing something proactively. So we'll see where that goes. That was in Cancun. It was a beautiful location. Hard work. Hard work. We served for two days. I don't know. Never made it to the beach, unfortunately. Um, and the GSHA, I don't want to spend time on that. Everybody's familiar with GSHA? Clearly there's One Health implications in there because it's about linking human health, animal health, the environment health. That seems to be kind of, people tend to forget that. Um, they also tend to forget the word security in there. Uh, so we see WHO very engaged in the health security agenda as long as the money is involved. Um, and the other sectors that kind of still want to participate, but it's been difficult, um, mostly because of the funding sources and who dominates those conversations. Uh, we were just at a meeting yesterday, we mentioned the uh, National Blueprint for Biodefense, the National Strategy for Biodefense just came out a couple of weeks ago from, um, from the Executive Office and the White House. It's a good, strong uh, components in there about One Health too, about linking the health and and animals and people, even some issues in the environment that are interesting. That was included, um, but a lot of us have well, been involved have been pushing that. Um, and then I just wanted to end by saying that everything can't be One Health, that there are reasons why, um, and there's some benefits of not trying to do everything together and collaboratively. The donors like siloed programs that they can measure really easily. Uh, sometimes they're just more efficient, faster, and more effective. So don't get all frustrated. And, um, everything's not a one health approach. There is room in the world for silos. They're really good for like storing corn. Um, <laughs> you want some vertical things. That's what they were actually designed for, and they're really good. And so there is a utility in the silo approaches. So it's one closer.